was reading the Red Book my, my first time through, it just, it struck me like a bolt of lightning when I read that passage, when Jung presents this kind of scenario that, that occurs to people in around their 35th year. And he, he termed it the shadow side, the, the descent into the shadow side of life. That if they, they do this turning inward during the shadow side of life, and they look for their soul and they don't find it, then they'll turn right back around to the external world, to the material world, and try to look for it there. And it'll, they'll turn around like a whip lashing them, but they'll never find their soul in the external world. MJ Dorian, thanks for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here, Alex. Thank you so much for inviting me. Looking forward to our conversation. What do you wish more people would understand about Carl Jung? I mean, there's, there's a lot there to dig into, but I would say that he, the, the way I view him in the context of the 20th century and psychology as a whole, uh, two things I would first say about him are that he was this very unique figure in that he basically became like the Nikola Tesla of psychology. The Nikola Tesla, of, obviously, originally of electrical engineering, he, he reinvented the field, he turned it upside down, and he brought something new and valuable to our lives or in technology, which is alternating current. Uh, Dr. Carl Jung did something similar because without him, you know, th that track of, of Freud's psychology would have been very much the dominant one, even though in, in some circles it still is. But Carl Jung came along and we could talk about the history there between the, those two figures, but he presented something so fresh and different that very much runs on a parallel track to modern psychology. And I, I, would, I would see him as this figure that's the Nikola Tesla of psychology. And then additionally, I would say that one thing that even people who are already interested in Jung's ideas and his theories tend to overlook is that he himself was also one of these creative genius figures. So coincidentally, he was just involved in the field of psychology. He could have just as easily went into a creative field, I believe. And when you look at books like The Art of C.G. Jung and um, his personal life, you see that he was constantly engaged by creative work. And I believe it's because of those creative inclinations that he was able to intuit these facets of the mind that he did. So that's that's where I would start with that. <laughs> yeah, let's talk a little bit about Freud and Jung, because Freud also was a revolutionary, you know, for his time. He, he was the one, he didn't necessarily come up with the idea of the unconscious, but he did popularize it. And in many, you know, at the time he was seen as extremely radical. And it's also, I always find it so interesting to see how much hate there is towards Freud. And for mm. my money, whenever you see a lot of hate and vitriol, you know that possibly that person may have been onto something when it stirs up a lot of negative emotion. What do you think are the key differences between Freudian psychology and Jungian psychology? Right. It's helpful to just note their history there, because honestly, I think that that interplay that was happening in the, in the early 1900s in the field of psychology between Freud and Jung it's one of the, the greatest stories of psychology in general. And so we can maybe just touch on that a moment. So Freud comes along and as you said, he, he presents this pivotal theory of the unconscious and, and his interpretation of it, psychopathology and complexes and such. And then Jung is, is also in, his, in training to be a psychologist and he, he's taken under the wing of Freud and he has clinical work. He early on works in a hospital with schizophrenics and such, and then he has his own private practice. And very much uh, in, this, um, in the field and among his colleagues, uh, he's seen as the heir apparent to Freud, that he's going to carry the torch after Freud has to you know, put down his working tools and such. But what ends up happening around 1910s is that Jung starts to have this split from Freud. They tend to have more arguments 
uh, in their personal interactions. And th there starts to be these, these distinctions that Jung can no longer parse with and he can no longer set aside. For one, he sees that Freud tends to have this very mm, pessimistic view of, of human nature in that he tends to associate all of, you know, an, an adult's complexes with uh, childhood traumas and sexuality and these kinds of things. And he refuses to acknowledge that there can be these other influences, you know, for neuroses. Uh, he also, in, in Jung's view, doesn't consider the unconscious going deep enough, that he kind of just takes the bar and stops it at the level of the personal unconscious. Uh, on the other hand, to Jung, Jung was very fascinated early on by religion, by spirituality, by dreams, so was Freud. But in Jung's view, there's deeper layers there to uncover, and these deeper layers influence us in daily life, in, in our life choices. And Freud seemed to refuse to acknowledge those or even consider, you know, their validity. And finally, um, he had he had a certain disregard for for a human's need for some kind of spiritual engagement. He tended to see religion as fantasy fulfillment. And on the other hand, Jung thought that, uh, you know, man's search for meaning and our engagement with spiritual practices was essential to human nature. So those inform basically how the two tend to branch off from that point on, I think. Why, why do you think Freud was so reluctant to change his thinking or, or to think that maybe Carl Jung had some good points? You know, do you think that this is a very difficult question to answer, so I'm not necessarily expecting you to answer it, but do, do you think he just thought that Jung was frankly incorrect? Or do you think based on the history that maybe Freud's ego was threatened? He was, you know, this giant in psychology at the time, and maybe he was feeling a bit undermined by his star disciple. Right. I mean, it's it's a topic uh, that I'm sure a, a number of books have explored because it, it, it creates, it, it presents a very loaded territory of, of these, obviously, these two early juggernauts of, of psychology and how they clashed. Uh, from my understanding, you know, sure, Freud had his own issues, his own ego involved in his work. And at that point, because he was so established, the, the idea of someone like Jung being able to present this alternate view was, was insulting, in a sense, because there was nobody else presenting an alternate view to Freud at the time. And so, you know, Freud probably saw mm, Jung in a sense of like a surrogate son and someone that, you know, would really be able to carry on his legacy. And for him to then say, well, you know, you have these major flaws here, I think was partially insulting. And, and I think it was personal by that point because they did split and then they didn't talk to each other for a number of years. So it, it was clearly more than just this kind of amicable professional split. There, there was a lot of personal emotions involved and, and intense kind of heated arguments. Yeah, it's always interesting when psychiatrists show their own neuroses, isn't it? <laughs> how, how did you become interested in Jung? You've done a whole series on Jung and your podcast, Creative Codex, which I certainly recommend. Uh, where did you come across Jung and why did he spark your interest? Right. So I've done a number of series on Jung in my podcast, which, which started as a personal fascination that I've, I've had for a very long time. And because of the very positive response to my initial series, which was only about the Red Book. Uh, I've delved further into other material of his, like the Seven Sermons to the Dead, and his his obsession with alchemy, each giving a few episodes per, per series. But early on, I would say, the thing that attracted me to Jung and Jung's theories is that myself as an artist, as, as a creative person, and, and as somebody interested in spiritual practices, Jung presents a framework in which to understand those human traits. The, the inclination to pull up a canvas and paint something. You know, the, the confusion of waking up from a dream that seemed incredibly profound, yet completely mis mysterious and foreign to you. 
you know, uh, and of course the inclination to want to engage with myth and want to have a spiritual practice and pursue these kinds of things. Jung presents a framework in which that makes sense and in which it encourages you to continue those things because even setting aside metaphysical um, instances or opinions, uh, he presents this uh, these ideas as valuable to your psychology in general, valuable to your mental health. And so I think that's what initially attracted me. Mm -hmm. So, and it's interesting because Jung came, of course, from the medical world. So he was a doctor, psychiatrist, then psychotherapist, and then particularly later in his life, he starts to build these bridges between psychology and spirituality but also creativity, which obviously means you can include a lot more people. People of, of a various dispositions can now become attracted to your work because you're creating connections between these disciplines, which are seemingly disparate, but actually might be more connected than they think. And of course, Jung paid a price for this because this is part of the reason for the split from Freud. This is part of the reason for the ostracization from the rest of the psychological community. He's, he's almost willingness to dive into things in a quite a integrative, holistic manner. I'd like to talk about dreams a bit. How, how, from a Jungian standpoint, how should we approach thinking about our dreams? Yeah, it's a completely fascinating topic. Well, I think as, as we're kind of laying the groundwork for, for this conversation, it would be also valuable to just uh, quickly present Jung's model of the psyche, because these theories and, and things that we'll discuss very much will make more sense in the context of uh, a rough idea of his model as, as it differs from, from other psychologists. So primarily we can say there's, there's four facets that are, are most notable in Jung's view of the psyche, and they would be the ego, the personal unconscious, the collective unconscious, and then the self with the capital S. So loosely defined, the ego would be easy to remember in the sense of its Latin definition, which simply is I, is the pronoun I. Anything that refers to itself in your mind as I is part of your conscious mind, and that's your ego. Uh, and this is stripping any you know positive or negative connotations that we might have in you know our colloquial use of the word ego. It's just anything that refers to itself as I. And that includes the mask of our persona that we wear in you know, social situations and such. Then there's the personal unconscious, which is anything that for whatever reason we've pushed back into our, our unconscious, whether it be memories, uh, personal complexes, our motivations, and, and these kinds of things. Those, that's unique to each individual. Then Jung uh, presents this idea that there's also the collective unconscious, which is in a sense more ancient than the other two. And if we imagine it kind of builds, uh, one builds on the other. And so the collective unconscious, we could say most notably contains the archetypes, which Jung described as, as images and these potentialities that bubble forth in our human experiences, in our stories, in our dreams, um, and in our life. Then the self with the capital S, the easiest way to imagine that is is it's the circle within whose bounds those all those other facets exist so the self is is kind of everything combined and oddly enough the self also has its own mm, direction that it wants to as a conductor of, of all those things that are going on uh, direct that story and we can talk about any of those, of course, but just remembering that that's kind of the model we're working within is helpful. Mm -hmm. And Jung also described not only a structure of the psyche, but like a process that people go through across their lives, a process of individuation. Can you walk us through a bit of what that process might look like? Sure. The way I think of it is that individuation is basically the project that the self is always working on. It's the life project of the human individual. And part of, of that project is the, the balancing of 
these kind of opposites that exist within us. So, you know, you may have a very prominent aspect of your conscious mind or your persona uh, as, you know, somebody incredibly virtuous, somebody who is, who is calm and, uh, you know, never triggers into anger. But then in the background, you know, in your unconscious, you have an undeveloped aspect of yourself um, that may present itself as, you know, a passive aggressive uh, comment here and there, or may occasionally result in you just exploding for no reason and you don't understand how that bubbled up. It didn't feel like that's you because it's not your conscious mind, it's coming from the unconscious. And so there's these opposites that exist within us that need to be reconciled. That's one of the, the processes that are occurring in individuation. Um, when one engages them, you're, you're, you're starting to reconcile these opposites. And then also, of course, there's your complexes that, you know, I visualize as these, these knots. They're just these balls of, of tension that in some way influence you uh, in your daily life often. And in the process of, you know, your, your life and addressing and, and co uh, con confronting these or just acknowledging them, you, you ease their tension and you bring them into the light of your consciousness, basically. So the process of individuation in its ultimate and ideal, idealized form would be you're bringing everything that is under that sea level iceberg um, into your conscious view. And then by the end of your life, it would be a wonderful thing if we all did. We, we saw all of those, you know, myriad, that multitude of influence that, that we've had throughout our life. Wow. And so, so much packed into those theories. And yes, absolutely. The resolving of psychological tension, or at least the bringing into awareness of psychological tension is so important. When you're unaware that you're being pulled in different directions, say mm -hmm. part of you wants to, part of you is ambitious and wants to work hard. And yet another part of you feels incredibly constrained by that and longs for freedom. If that's a kind of tension that you're unaware of, it can define your life. It can rule you. It can cause you a lot of mental suffering, a lot of neurosis. Right. And just becoming aware of these tensions, it's not everything, but becoming aware is such an important first step. So this idea of tension, I think both Freud and Jung really helped people to understand. Obviously, Jung, you could argue on a somewhat deeper level. Mm. So ha having covered a little bit about how Jung thought about the mind, going back to dreams. Mm, sure. What? Because again, Freud and Jung differed about the approach to dreams. What was the Jungian approach to dreams? So it's viewed in Jungian analysis that the dream life of an individual is where the unconscious basically communicates to your conscious mind. Uh, the, the division between them is now lowered and your dreams are direct communications from what's existing and what's, what, what these various uh, motivations and what these influences are on you that exist in your unconscious. And at times those will bubble up from also what Jung termed the collective unconscious. But most often, especially the ones that, that feel very emotionally um, wrought and you know, engaging, those are existing from what you have and what you carry in your personal unconscious. But the, the problem is, and why you know, an analysts exist, is that the dreams and the, the, the language of the unconscious, you could say, is uh, through symbol and metaphor. And this is naturally very confusing, and it's resulted in people, you know, throughout uh, the centuries inventing, you know, dream dictionaries, this symbol means that symbol and such, which is a little bit of a misguided effort. In, in Jungian theory, it's understood that although there are archetypes and they tend to have universal meanings, for each individual, th those, those symbols can and often do take on personal significance. You know, if I see a cat in a dream, if you see a cat in a dream, depending on our experience with cats in our lives, it means totally something different. And so I, I don't know if that answers uh, part of your question, but that, that's, those are my thoughts at the moment. Yeah, and important to point out the distinction between the Jungian view and the Freudian view. So as you mentioned, dreams are a bit obscure and 
there's a symbolic language to dreams and my understanding and correct me if i'm wrong is that as you mentioned jung felt that dreams were symbolic because that was simply the language of the unconscious you could also call it the right hemisphere of the brain if you wanted to like the unconscious is communicating to us in the best way it knows how and that's through symbols and my understanding is freud felt it was symbolic because there was an element of repression like your mm. mind was trying to guard itself against itself and i think you know both theories have validity but certainly the idea that our unconscious is co is trying to communicate to us in the best way it knows how is compelling to me particularly because sometimes dreams are very literal and um, sometimes mm. at least in my experience my when i think about my own dreams sometimes they're symbolic but sometimes they're as as clear as possible so i, I don't necessarily buy the idea that there's that um inbuilt repression so Im important to point out and then the other thing i would point out is that particularly when i'm working with people clinically it's very hard to interpret someone's dream unless you know what they're going through in their personal life it's right. like essential so i can give you an example of that uh, mm -hmm. i knew someone who had a dream that they were putting their hand into a mixed bag of chocolates Mm. And there were two possibilities. They either only get one chocolate or the other. And they didn't get the chocolate that they wanted. But rather, strangely, they kept pulling out their father's favorite chocolate and not theirs. Mm. And then, you know, that's, that's, you know, hard to interpret, hard to know exactly what's going on until you find out about that person's personal life. And they'll tell you very plainly, I'm currently working with my father and feel like I'm doing all the kind of work that he likes to do and none of the kind of work that I like <laughs> to do. And then all of a sudden, right. the dream makes a lot of sense. Sure. Right. Yeah. And again, yeah. If one were to use a dream dictionary, it'd be like chocolate means this. But it's like, well, no, we, we have all these the, the, the relationship dynamics being involved as well, like you're, what you're saying. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a tricky business interpreting a dream, but there's there's tremendous value in it because again it's 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 communicating something that is outside of one's awareness and the the, the Jungian analyst and author Robert Johnson has a, an amazing amazing book called Inner Work that is is all about dream interpretation uh, through the Jungian lens and in a very very practical way it's 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 brilliant I'm I'm reading through it the second time right now but there's just a lot a lot he fills in a very short span. Yeah. And from Jung himself, what are the books that you might direct people to read first if they if they wanted to learn more about Jung? I know a lot of his works are quite dense and quite difficult to get through. Are there any in particular you would recommend? Yeah, Always Man and His Symbols is a great start. And this is a book that he wrote toward the end of his life, which was largely motivated by his colleagues basically saying that you know you have these theories of mind that could provide so much value to to the common man and, and woman um, but up until that point his his psychology uh, was, was largely followed by clinicians and that's partially why his work when one tries to read it is is so academic and mm, dense because that was the intended audience but this book, Man and His Symbols, was intended for more of a broad audience, and it includes various essays from Jung, but also from his colleagues like Marie-Louise von Franz and such, who, in, in a sense, uh, Jung gave his stamp of approval to in, in these essays that they write for more of, a, more of a broad audience. And then beyond that, a very approachable book also is what's his, essentially his autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, where Jung talks very candidly and openly about his own life and his dreams throughout his life that were meaningful to him and visions and his experiences initially writing the Red Book, which he only talks about in, in kind of these, these side references, because at the time it, the Red Book wasn't known publicly, but he, he refers to it in these very significant ways as, as an important experience. So, so those two. Okay. I've read 
man and his search for meaning which i would also recommend and particularly in that book he's talking about how things have unfolded during the 20th century and how he's his concerns about how things might continue to unfold if we're if young were around today how do you think he would view the way politics and culture have progressed do you think it'd be pleased at the direction that things have gone in what, what, what do you think he'd make of it i think uh, <laughs> it's i mean it's so hard to to you know uh, assume for for Jung on certain opinions like this um i have so much respect for him uh, it would be uh, you know it, it would be very haughty of me to try to assume that i can think like him but i mean i certainly he would see these grand stories of the archetypes playing out on the world stage uh, as they are today through our politicians through our wars through these various conflicts that we continue to have we essentially as as a human species have the same problems that we had when jung was still alive and they're they've only become more exaggerated so um, he would still have the same sense of impending doom and danger that he had toward the end of his life the last few years he had he had a few visions of um, a great apocalypse or a catastrophe that he told this to marie louise von franz and, and she's never shared the exact details of it in, in any written or video form but she says that she she had this, this paper so that paper is somewhere of exactly what his vision was but essentially that the way i see it is humanity is always on the brink of self-destruction and partially this is due to our inability to um, recognize th these motivations influences that that exist in our unconscious that propel individuals nations and communities towards certain ends that are sometimes self-destructive and so uh, th that's partially i think my thoughts on it yeah and i guess he would have also commented i suppose on the fact that the gap of meaning that we have in our society and culture has just continued to grow. Uh, my understanding is that he talked a lot about the decline of religion as an important institution and that that religion was leaving a very important gap and that gap was going to be filled by what he saw as more superficial manifestations of the culture, mm. like, for example, our politics, as mm. you mentioned, and that as far as I can tell, since the 20th century, that problem has only gotten worse. And mm -hmm. I, this is why I think there is such a resurgence of interest in things like ancient philosophy, uh, which you see in a lot of long form content, a lot of podcasts, because I think on one level or another, we're becoming increasingly aware that a, a given society or given culture used to run on these long-standing existential mm -hmm. pillars and those pillars have been wiped away and now it's like conservatives versus liberals on tiktok and that's like not a substitute at all for the fundamental anchors of your society right no a great point i wish i would have thought of it myself but i do have some thoughts on it so in jung's red book he mentions these two influences that i suppose he implies exist in every individual and this goes back to what you're saying that there is the spirit of this time and the spirit of the depths. So what we could say is, is occurring in this scenario where I agree people who are otherwise raised without any formal religion, any, any formal spiritual practice that connects them to a native faith or to, to their own ancestry, which, yeah, it is, I think, a detriment to society they're finding these other avenues they're getting interested in ancient cultures they're you know reading plato's dialogues and engaging with uh, perhaps their own way into those cultures through uh, whether it's witchcraft or anything else they find and i think what they're responding to is the spirit of the depths which jung talks about uh, at length in the red book and it's a call from these more ancient parts of our mind uh, a call toward timeless things 
things that can be revived, you know, that have long since died. And in many ways that can connect us to the past and connect us to, you know, ancestors and, and, and these kinds of influences. And while the spirit of this time is the most superficial layer of society that includes our politics, includes our celebrities and such, which with every generation essentially becomes wiped away and replaced. And when we fixate on, on that level too much, even though it may uh, you know, give some dopamine release and such in, in the moment, we find it very unsatisfactory in the long term, I think. Yeah, and it's just not going to be something that sees you through the ups and downs of mm. life. And that's something I see clinically. And funnily enough, I think the context in which I saw it the most was when I worked in an addiction clinic, mm. where often you're seeing people who are either addicted to alcohol, heroin, very commonly cocaine, and they're trying to figure out how to come off a drug like that. Mm. And the biggest thing they often, the biggest mistake uh, someone with an addiction like that often makes is they focus on come, how to come off the drug, but they don't focus on how do I build a life that would make it unsatisfactory to go back to drugs. Mm. And I think that's because as soon as you tackle that much harder, much deeper question, you are facing existential issues you know what mm. actually do i value about my life mm. what is there to value about life in general mm. and within this very medicalized way of viewing addiction there almost isn't room to that to have those conversations so i found myself mm. having these more existential conversations with my patients there and this is not in a psychotherapy context this is more of a medical context where my role was more as their physician than as their mm, therapist right and yet it it felt that you know the, the medical stuff obviously had to be taken care of but once the medical stuff is taken care of then it felt like it would have been a disservice to the patient to not take things on that more existential level right no that makes total sense and, and i'm sure that that was appreciated by by the people who you were speaking to in that regard and maybe we can pivot in a mo for for the moment to that. So, in your experience, you know, as a clinician, psychiatrist, are there moments where you see either this gap in modern psychology and, and it, the medical approach, and perhaps this this way that that Jung and the theories of of Jung address th these kinds of gaps. Yes, so I think the gap is the same. The same gap he talked about, the meaning gap, if you like, and other prominent intellectuals have referred to it as the meaning crisis. Uh, I believe John Vervaki, who is a psychologist, psychology, ac academic psychologist in Canada, has talked about it as the meaning crisis. Other people have talked about it as a spiritual blackout. I think that very much exists within both medical psychiatry and academic and clinical psychology both of those disciplines have a lot of value to offer but both of those disciplines are looking at the mind and as people in my view through too much of a mechanistic lens the brain is a engine or the brain is a computer and you know something i learned from ian mcgillchrist who, who's a psychiatrist who also studies and thinks about the brain is that when you use a particular analogy to describe something, you're trapped within the limits of that analogy. So yes, in many ways, the brain is computer-like, but by using, by saying the brain is a computer, you're now trapped thinking about it within those bounds. And even though the brain is computer-like, the brain is also much more than a computer. So what I'm getting at is that I think these disciplines view human beings and the human mind in a too limited a capacity and makes it too easy to cut off the need for things like spirituality, things like transcendent experiences, things like a need for deeper wisdom traditions. I think through a, a more mechanistic lens, those 
those things I just mentioned are seen as, as decadent or as a fantasy, as Freud may have thought thought of them uh, as a kind of uh, aberration or anomaly or a mistake. And as a society, I can't help but see the constant, constant psychological suffering that's produced from that. The suffering from not connecting to our deeper like pathos as a species, our deeper problems, the just the, the universal problems of being alive is something that's completely missed when you throw that stuff out of the way. So sorry, that was a long rant, but I hope I answered your no, question sure. in some way. That's fantastic. No, it, it's it's heartening to see, you know, uh, someone who works, you know, in the medical field who's concerned with those things, because like you say, uh, <laughs> once the the very clear medical issue is addressed, then there's these these other things that come to the fore, which in in some instances can be even psychosomatic, right? Someone's existential crisis can lead them to have a physical ailment or uh, some issue or maybe just even a drop in their I immunity level and, and such. So uh, there, there's the entire health of the individual at stake. Yeah, definitely. And on that note, you know, Jung talked about a particular existential crisis that people can go to, I go through, I believe in the like mid thirties. And he talked about that yes. in the red book, I think. Yes, can you talk yes, yes. A little bit about that. What are these, you know, no coincidence. I'm in my mid thirties, but what are the kind of crises <laughs> that people of that age, hypothetically, I'm asking for a friend might go through during that time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is one of those moments when I was reading the red book, my, my first time through that it just, it struck me like a bolt of lightning when I read that passage, when Jung presents this kind of scenario that, that occurs to people in around their 35th year. And I believe I read it around that, that, that age as well. And he, he termed it the shadow side, the, the descent into the shadow side of life, where someone in, in his view during that writing, he says, they begin to look for their soul and uh, they have this turning inward that occurs. And if they don't find it, which is very unsettling to read from him to say that if they, they do this turning inward during the shadow side of life and they look for their soul and they don't find it, then they'll turn right back around to the external world, to the material world and try to look for it there. And it'll, they'll turn around like a whip lashing them, but they'll never find their soul in the external world. And they'll, they'll go for this, um, basically an, an, an indulgent kind of uh, whiplash back into the uh, material world that basically is, is a fruitless endeavor. But uh, th this, this idea is just such a compelling one. And uh, it's important to note that Jung's visions that caused him to start writing the Red Book occurred to him in his late 30s as well as, as he's nearing 40. So so there's something to that, I think. Uh, and I think maybe it also has to do with this idea that by that point in life, let's say, you know, mid 30s, you're old enough to have experienced a few things that that change you, that that alter you. You've, you've seen a few tragedies. Maybe you've lost a friend, you've lost a loved one, you've, you've lost some family members, you've had a relationship or two go sour, and you've seen other people, you know, mourn and lose things. And you start to take life a little more seriously. And you start to question, you know, what else is there? What, what else is beyond life? You know, where do I find my meaning? What, what else do I want from life, uh, from what's left of it? And I think that's part of it too. I think there's a real practical element there and why perhaps that would occur at that point in time. Yeah, I think in that period of life, we start to come to terms with, like you said, it's limitations, it's finitude, and then everything takes on a new level of seriousness. And I actually think that maybe it's, for for men a kind of mid-30s thing but i actually think for women it happens a lot earlier i think for 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 various reasons you know the differences between the sexes women have to contend with the fact that life is 
very a very serious prospect a lot earlier you know they mature younger sexually but also psychologically but certainly at some point you have to come to terms with the dangers and the the restrictions of life and before that you're kind of in this this period of almost naive optimism and going going through that process where it's inevitable part of maturation and I, I guess it brings home the idea that growth is not necessarily pleasant like growth can be filled with pain as it was for young so so maybe you can tell us you know what was happening to young when he was writing the red book sure yeah again this is part of that thing that i was mentioning is one of the greatest stories of, of psychology so the the impetus to write the red book comes from jung's split from freud and the reason being there is that uh, he has an immense support network of, of colleagues and friends that are now tied to Freudian thought and that that line of psychology. But as as he splits from Freud, he also basically loses this social support network and he uh, becomes derided by uh, these people that he used to call friends. And in the papers that he writes, uh, they start to label him in, in what they they termed a pejorative word, which was a mystic. They said, no, now, who is who, who does he think he is? Some kind of mystic. And so he's now facing this crisis, this very personal and, and existential crisis in his life, where he still has his own personal practice, but he's basically, uh, he's been pushed out of the nest in that regard. And during that upheaval, he, in October 1913, is he's traveling on a train through the Swiss Alps and he has what he terms a vision and it's this apocalyptic vision of a, a great flood uh, in which he sees the bodies of countless thousands and then this river becomes blood and he says that it, he cannot shake the vision that it stays with him for for quite a while and then this recurs throughout the next few weeks as well that specific type of vision, but also another one in the following year. And so he feels that there's there's something going on under the surface. And he would do a disservice to his clinical patients in therapy who, who may be going through similar things if he didn't try to understand what was happening with himself. And so part of that process is uh, every evening practically, according to his notes and his journal entries, he sits down, you know, after everyone has uh, probably gone to bed, um, he has his, his, his tobacco pipe and such, and he enters into a state of meditation where he then engages something that I've called the digging method. This is visualization that, that he uses, um, where he proceeds to take this fantasy and kind of turn it inward on itself and travel down into these these imaginary depths and in that process he starts to interact with his unconscious contents and these things he terms visions we basically have have no good word to approximate what it is he's doing because it's it's such a foreign thing for us you know as adults to do but he will we'll term them visions and so he he writes them down and catalogs them initially into what are called the black books, which are just his personal journals about these experiences. And then he proceeds to take the next step and give them even more of this kind of value and, and re reflection on them by um, writing them out in calligraphy in what's called the Red Book, which is this big leather bound volume. And he writes them out by hand and he even paints illustrations within there. So it ends up looking like this medieval illuminated manuscript. When, when someone opens it. And it's quite large too. It's uh, 12 inches wide by 15 inches long. And so that begins the process of, of the Red Book, which lasts a number of years that he works on it. So if you, if you look at the Red Book, it's got these amazing illustrations. And if you're interested, definitely look those up. You know, they're, they're like... All, it's like a collection of paintings essentially and I guess that's what's interested you as an artist you know it's sure it's a is it fair to say the red book is an amazing work of art you know independent of the psychological value 
Sure. I mean, I would say certainly it's it's a great work of literature in just its sheer uniqueness. And it's certainly a work of art, though Jung didn't see it as such. You know, he never wanted to exhibit any of his paintings or anything like that. He shied away from presenting himself publicly as, you know, as an artist. Uh, he, he saw this as, as a function of his own, in a sense, his own therapy, his own investigations of his unconscious. And that th this process of externalizing these visions, these interactions with his unconscious, that they, they cemented certain insights and, and brought forth more um, the, the ability to process these, these changes that were happening in him. But, but yes, certainly, most people see it, including myself, as a work of art and, and a great work of literature. And something I'd like to go back to briefly is that, you know, in 1913, he has this, apo uh, this apocalyptic vision of mm -hmm. that, you know, and it's not necessarily, you know, uh, a concrete prediction about what's going to happen, but it's this apocalyptic vision. And then the next year, World War One happens. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and... I, I, I'd like to emphasize this because I think often when we look at things that have happened in history, because they happened, there's a sense of inevitability and a, we can ascribe a sense of intentionality to the important leaders in that time that, you know, World War One was a thing that happened. It was caused by this person and this person and that person. But something I'd like to point out about World War One, and I'm not a historian, but this is my understanding, is that no one really knew that was going to happen. You know, people thought there would be some kind of conflict. Maybe it would be a larger conflict than others. But no one knew it was going to be World War One, the most unprecedented conflict we've seen at that time. Mm. And part of the reason that that happened is just the the unpredictability of geopolitics but also the mm. technology that was available at that time and particularly the invention of the machine gun and mm. it was you know very much the open the combination of that the, the geopolitical turmoil and the opening of the pandora's box of technology combined with no ethical overarching structure mm. no moral structure no meaning structure as Jung would have pointed out to help us realize that hey things are going in a bad direction and if you combine right. a with b we're gonna get the apocalypse so i thought that was worth <laughs> emphasizing and then not only did that happen but then it happened again <laughs> like, like a few a few decades later uh, yeah his history is it's called uh, what did they say history doesn't repeat itself but it does rhyme the same scenarios, you know, keep reoccurring and we keep making the same mistakes, you know, hopefully we keep growing, too. Uh, but what you mentioned is, is, is yes, it's an important uh, side note there. And, I, and Jung recognized that as well, because from that first initial apocalyptic vision to then that vision recurring and then another one taking its place in his dreams afterward, which was one of a great frost coming over the world. And in that vision of, of the great frost where, you know, many lives were lost and also, you know, vegetation, uh, the ability to, to eat uh, plants and such was lost. At the end of that vision, he sees himself as um, grabbing these uh, sweet grapes from a tree and, and giving them out to people uh, as a form of sustenance. So there's, there's kind of almost like a resolution there. And, and that dream started to occur to him um, about a month before the, the war broke out. So he recognized that there, at first he assumed that those dreams were indications of the mental strife that was going on in his own unconscious. But then once, you know, those events happened and World War I erupted, he started to consider, was that precognition? Was that some kind of influence from the collective unconscious coming up? I tend to believe personally, you know, after having you know, reflected on this many times, I think it was both. I think the mind has these interesting abilities to bring forth um, symbols and insights and such when there's a confluence of factors. In that instance, I think uh, Jung, at the crossroads and such, at that instance, I think Jung was going through what would be called a mental breakdown. But at the same time, 
there were there were indications that the world was about to hit the same kind of point. And so the reason those dreams recur to him and then even shift, but still keep their apocalyptic um, feel to them, I think is because there's this confluence of both occurring. Yes, and then that, that points to the different ways you could look at what a mental breakdown is. Mm. And again, going back to the way things are viewed typically clinically in a modern environment, a breakdown is bad, you know, my mm. car breaks down, that's a bad thing. But again, referring to what I said earlier, our minds aren't cars, you know, our minds aren't machines. Mm. And importantly, the, the, the interesting thing about the human mind is breakdown certainly can be a bad thing and a breakdown can take you out. And I have seen that happen, but a contained breakdown a breakdown which can be managed a breakdown that you recover from reasonably that can actually take you forward because it mm. means that you know and i'm using the breakdown the word breakdown very generically so you know the, the, you might have a breakdown with psychotic symptoms or, or depression or parts of your personality changing but let's just think about right. it generically a breakdown that you can face, that you're somehow able to confront, that you're supported with and that you can recover from can actually get you to a higher level, which is very different from a, a machine. A machine cannot recover mm. from a breakdown and actually get better. Right. Human beings can because the strange thing about human beings is you can have a breakdown. That means the paradigm through which you've been looking at the world dissolves mm -hmm. and you can enter a more sophisticated paradigm, a paradigm mm. of greater depth or a paradigm of greater maturity and my understanding is this is something that Jung talked about quite a bit right right I mean I'm really interested in, in hearing you know your thoughts and your experiences either personal or, or professional otherwise in, in these kinds of scenarios but I, I think that completely makes sense to me you know the idea that a breakdown if it's not you know completely debilitating is an opportunity as well to, to rebuild something stronger, to rebuild something that lasts longer, that perhaps one ha is now building based on the knowledge one gained from uh, the tragedy perhaps that just occurred or the misfortune that one faced. I think that's, that's an important facet of, of life that we, um, we overlook or maybe don't acknowledge. So, so thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and it's definitely something I've seen clinically. And this is something that's actually well acknowledged in psychotherapy that today's coping mechanism is tomorrow's crutch. You know, every coping mechanism, although it can be useful, has limitations. So like even mm. let's take the most basic coping mechanism or the most basic defense mechanism like repression. Freud talked about this, you know, in the short term, if something really unpleasant happens, Repressing it is a good idea because it means you don't have to deal with it. And isn't that a wonderful <laughs> thing? But in the long term, if you repress something, and this is something Freud pointed out, it will come back in uglier ways or ways which are more damaging or more corrosive. But this isn't just true with like more unsophisticated coping mechanisms like repression. It's true for any way we cope with life. Um, for some people, you know, I think we're living in an era where we lots of people cope with life with ambition you know mm. we live in a very ambitious individualistic culture and ambition is one of the ways we try and deal with some of the unpleasantness of life we try and think well as long as you know i'm being all i can be and i'm optimizing my nutrition and optimizing my body and optimizing my bank account everything's gonna be great and that's you know for many reasons, that's a great coping mechanism because it's a coping mechanism that means you can build a great life, but it can only guard you against some of the deeper sort of tragedies of life for so long before at mm. some point, whether it's your, in your mid thirties or later, you have to, you have to confront them. So I think the meta coping skill is the ability to acknowledge and change your coping mechanisms regularly 
right. to recognize when that's necessary, which is, you know, what I'm saying is not an easy thing and I'm no, you know, master at it myself, but I think that's what the meta skill is, is the ability to realize when a coping mechanism has exhausted itself and maybe when mm. we need to try something new. And I think to remain psychologically healthy, that is a lifelong process. Right, 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 right. You know, it reminds me of, of a personal experience that um, it was along these lines. And now, a, a few years ago, one of my best friends died and it was kind of sudden and unexpected. And, you know, he left behind uh, his wife and his seven year old child, which we're still very close to and we're close to at the time. But due to that experience, I mean, initially, it's the the upheaval of the first few months of grief. And it was surprisingly intense grief in, in my case, because I didn't realize how close our relationship had gotten over about 20 some odd years. It snuck up on me. And so his death um, was very, it, it brought up a lot of things for me. And so, you know, I spoke with a grief counselor and such, and, and that was very, very helpful. Um, but I, the reason I bring it up in this context was it, it was a type of breakdown of, of my framework of life. And I knew that it was a breakdown because I, I couldn't do art anymore while I was processing this grief, while I was experiencing living through it. And so, so I, I understood that to be okay. Something is, is being rebuilt inside of me. And same thing was going on, you know, with his wife and, and obviously in, in many more intense ways. But in the aftermath of this, you know, now that an, a few years have passed, I can say that because of that loss and because of that grief that I experienced, it's opened me up to be more emotional. And that's not a bad thing. It's opened me up to, uh, to connect more with, with individuals, with people. And I think partially the reason is because I understand what's at stake. Now, you know, I understand that when, you know, a family loses their father or their mother and only one is left and the child and I see what effect that has both personally because, you know, I, I experienced some of that grief, but also just in living close to that, you know, by trying our best to take care of um, them in, in the aftermath. And so I know what's at stake. And so rather than closing me off, you know, Perhaps that would have happened if I would have brushed it aside and tried not to acknowledge the grief or just go on living, you know. Um, it's made me uh, able to, I think, connect more emotionally with, with other people. Yeah, that's a, that's a big insight, you know. Like, you, you, see, you see the limits of, of... There's something about understanding the limits of life help you see the value of life. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. How have some of Jung's ideas, you know, you're a, you're a creative person and it sounds like you create in so many domains, you know, music, podcasts, etc. How have Jung's ideas influenced you creatively as you go through the creative process? Well, uh, mainly it, it helps me understand the, the structure of it in terms of the, the potential influences of any given, you know, work of art. Uh, music or or poetry uh, occasionally an influence arises like while I'm about to fall asleep in this kind of hypnagogic state and I see an image or a melody or or something that captivates me and I, I need to then you know create it externally and so uh, Jung's framework helps me understand what's happening there so I'm not um, misattributing things but also um, I can help it along sometimes because I, I understand it a little more, I feel like. But other than that, in terms of like this idea of archetypes and such, I try not to influence th those things superficially. You know, like somebody might try to write a script for a movie and they'll say like, let me lay out all the archetypes and I know that this archetype works with that one and then we have to make sure that they clash and, you know, superficially influencing the structure. I, I think that that can in the end result in in a subpar work that that doesn't feel true or organic and so in that regard i certainly don't try to like create a formula of like knowing that in the collective unconscious this is going to bubble up or whatever you know 
uh, I think the, the organic aspect of any work of art, any creative work, is, is the most valuable aspect of it, because you shouldn't really know where it comes from until it's already in front of you in that regard. Yeah, that's interesting. So you're saying if you... And I think most people intuitively try and create like this if they're new. If you put your conscious mind at the driver's seat, you're not going to generate anything tr truly creative. True creativity needs to come more from the unconscious, which is why accessing that hypnagogic state right before sleep or right after sleep, it gives you that gateway to things that not even you are aware of, letting that bubble up and letting that take the wheel in the creative process, if you like. Yeah, no, absolutely. What's fascinating, I think, is that the, those influences that exist in the unconscious of, like, let's say, an artist for, for this sake, they, the work that comes out from those influences can be personally meaningful, but also can, can serve a very specific, meaningful purpose in the culture that artist exists within. And so the work may come out, and to the artist, they don't always oftentimes understand what this work means, but they feel that it's meaningful, consequential, and important to, to produce. And then only after the fact, one realizes that, oh, you know, this is serving this, this greater purpose within the, the, the fabric of the culture they live within. And it becomes an important work for, for other people too, you know, and not just personal work. So there's these influences that we don't understand or don't realize are, are, are propelling us towards certain directions, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think it even applies to speaking and conversation and podcasting because, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how scripted your podcasts are, for example, but because my podcasts are largely conversations, you know, I might get asked, how do you get, how do you generate a conversation that flows? And again, someone's intuitive approach might be, you know, having all the perfect questions prepared from before and how do you know exactly what you're going to say? And, you know, preparation is important and having questions mm. prepared is important. But generally speaking, in a conversation, you're going to want to let things bubble up to your mind, both questions, but also comments and, and <laughs> impromptu rants you might go on. You want to let those bubble up and go with them. Right. And that being the case, speaking well, having a good conversation is less about sort of frantically trying to control every word that comes out of your mouth. It's not a control mechanism. It's more an allowing. Mm. Allow yourself to be open to different thoughts and feelings which occur to you and then have the courage to express them with the full knowledge that maybe you'll say something dumb, but right. you know, and you might, you know, but, but you'll also say the best stuff, the best stuff will also come out during that process. I think. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, sp that spon spontaneity invites uh, kind of uh, deeper insights and things that you wouldn't have considered just through conscious kind of uh, processing earlier on when, like you have to make the checklist of all the questions. You have to make sure you've you've asked and such. I agree. I totally agree that a good conversation is, is more like uh, a jazz performance rather than you know this this kind of mathematical checking of of the to do list. And in a jazz performance, as as a musician myself, uh, I can say that you know the jazz music. Very few jazz musicians do like pure improvisation. It's always, you know, you have your, your piece laid out in terms of, you know, your verse, chorus, verse uh, and such. And then you know what the melody is, but you, you leave room for yourself to improvise throughout in certain sections. You know, th there's a looseness to it and that varies, you know, from performer to performer. But the core idea of it is that there's a structure within which you can improvise, basically. Yeah, yeah, the beautiful dance scene structure and improvisation and it even works for psychotherapy because mm. spontaneity is the is the engine of psychotherapy it's what makes it go it's mm. how people come to realize things about themselves which they weren't previously aware of the most common thing people say in psychotherapy sessions is you know i don't know where to start and mm. really the key is just start and keep going and see where it goes and don't feel like this is what I would tell to my clients. Don't feel like it has to be correct. 
or relevant or don't feel like it has to make sense grammatical or otherwise just let yourself speak and don't worry it will go in a useful direction and almost always it does if you let yourself do that but then some clients they can be too clamped down on what that they have to say the correct thing and then ironically that's Mm. stifling them and and it's it's counterproductive um so there's a lot of there's a lot of people who who i think who aspire to be creative do you you think we live in a good time to be creative it's tricky uh it's it's a yes and and no kind of answer uh overall though i think there's more yes uh, on, on that spectrum than no because the the ability of of the internet and our our kind of leveling of the playing field of of how um, as a creator you can engage a certain level of visibility that you know 20 years ago would that be even before the internet or is it now 30 years ago <laughs> or at least 30 years ago before it was the 50 years ago <laughs> 50 years ago <laughs> so so pre-internet time there there was very much a structure of you know uh, uh, industry gatekeepers for for each industry that you're interested in participating in, whether it's film or music or or even visual art. Uh, but the internet has leveled that playing field. At the same time, though, since the internet has been around as long as it has, those industries have figured out a way to have a foothold again. So you know, with music, if you're in the music industry, you're making songs and you put them on Spotify and such. You know, Spotify now has deals with very specific record companies. And so the music that gets more likely pushed to new listeners is music that they already have a deal with, with the record company, you know, that's paying them and such. So uh, th- those industries, again, have a foothold. But overall, I think that like even just your podcast, my podcast, the fact that we can uh, publish something that then has the potential to reach an international base of listeners is is overall a plus and in that regard it it is a wonderful time to to be a creative that uh, is courageous enough to create consequential works what's courageous about creativity i mean the the fact alone of uh, being able to externalize something that could potentially be derided, made fun of, that could potentially be a complete failure, takes courage. So uh, there's the ability of your self-critique to be the danger. You know, you create something and then you beat yourself up because you failed or you didn't achieve it the way you had envisioned it. So it takes courage against your, your future own, your future critiques. But then of course, the more obvious one would be it takes courage to create anything that then enters the public eye or even the eye of a single audience member who it's directed toward a loved one or you know a romantic interest because again you don't know what the reaction is going to be and oftentimes if if it's a very meaningful piece to you no matter what creative work it is um you're sharing a certain piece of your soul or your heart with other people and so every, to me, every creative act is an act of courage. Absolutely. And how, how did you deal with that? Was that something, was that a struggle with you or were you just so engrossed in the creative process that you were going to do it regardless of what other people thought? Right. I mean, early on, luckily, I, I recognized that I, I, as a teenager, gained a lot of satisfaction from the creative process, you know, creating visual art, painting, drawing, writing songs. I realized that at one point, as I was, you know, learning, learning guitar, that I enjoyed creating songs more than playing other people's songs. So, you know, there's people who go into Juilliard to be musicians and performers, and then there's people who go into Juilliard to be composers, you know, who just the right writing of the music. And so I realized early on that I, it just uh, was such a love of mine. And so luckily my parents, you know, had the, mm, the, the wisdom to say, okay, well, if he's interested in art, maybe, you know, let him go to 
an art high school, like an art-centric high school. So I went to the High School of Art and Design in Manhattan, here in New York City. And there I became enmeshed in, you know, a community of other misfits who were also, you know, the artists of their local communities. And uh, after that, you know, I, there's, there's no way to, to drop creative effort and work after, you know, those early kind of foundational experiences. So I think that's what I would say. Yeah, I think just having those early reference experiences, the ability to put something out that's flawed or have it fail or realize that failure isn't, is in some sense, failure isn't real in the sense that something can perform in a, less than you want it to or and somehow be inadequate and yet you can still derive a lot of value from it and it can help inform the next thing you, you make, you know. Right. I think if you view things through the right lens, there there's a lot of useful failure which we kind of ignore and we kind of make failure into this monster. But actually failure is just part of getting breath out of any process, whether it's creative or otherwise. And it's good to see that you had kind of that early positive experience. And I'm sure that's why you've been able to go on and create it at such high volume. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You know, I mean, I look at failure as as a mix between an exploration and a result. Because if you look at it as just a result, it's just, you know, well, you do something and there's always a result, right? And uh, if you do this, that's what happens. Uh, but otherwise, if you also look at it as an exploration, there's something to learn from explorations, you know, an experiment or exploration. So there's something you can then carry forth. And oftentimes I could say that in, in most works of, of creative people, you know, that I cover and such, and in my own life, uh, those, those perceived failures do teach you a lot that you then build on to then create something really great. And without those initial explorations that may have resulted in failure, the eventual, you know, uh, really insightful creations wouldn't be possible. Definitely. Creativity is a long game. Right. <laughs> yeah, in many ways. Yeah. We're out of time, but MJ, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. Where can people go to find out more about your work? Sure. There's, I would say, two main places. There's my podcast, Creative Codex, that's C-O-D-E-X, and that's available on Spotify and every podcast platform. And then there's just mainly for social media, I exist on my Instagram, which is at my name, MJ Dorian one word with no spaces and yeah those two perfect mj dorian thanks very much thank you so much alex it's been a pleasure